an example MCDA for fisheries improvements and river restoration projects. Um, and this is a example project that's we're going to the second phase of construction today in Nebraska on uh, and it's working with Trout Unlimited and Nebraska Game and Parks to try to restore a trout fisheries habitat. Before I get into that, I'm going to share. Uh, there you go. I'm going to share a um, advertisement. Uh, George Kelly um, decided to uh, uh, share this with me, and on Thursday, October eighth, at uh, 10 a.m. Mountain uh, Daylight Time, there's going to be a uh, presentation on developing long-term viability stream restoration and the main steps for considering and lessons learned from work being done in Australia and Mexico by uh, Mark Briggs um, and then also Osterkamp um, who is retired from the USGS. So basically talk about uh, long-term uh, stream restoration and uh, monitoring of these things and lessons learned from them. So it might be something that's handy to uh, uh, watch if you have time. It's being sponsored by uh, I think Westervelt uh, Ecological Services. So if you get a chance, you can check that out this week. Um, we're probably gonna have one of the River Shared, uh, we're probably gonna have Sarah's River Shared record it for us. So that if you don't get to watch it, uh, it will eventually, we'll ask the permission, we'll, we'll eventually have it posted probably. So I'm gonna give you a quick, quick background on MCDA. And MCDA looks at goals and objectives. Uh, of a project looks at alternatives or options, and then it tries to create criteria from the objectives, makes a weighting factor, uh, and then you do a sum of products, and it will give you, uh, by an MCDA score, if you do a golf score, it will give you which one is the most optimal based on your goals and objectives. So we're gonna use how this MCDA was used on a project in Nebraska we're working on. So we talked about design optimization based on MCDA goals. And a lot of times we talk about cut fill. Uh, this project that we're working on had a lot more uh, criteria and a lot of it was related to the increase in variability and diversity of, of uh, uh, fisheries and species for here. We were concerned about both duck habitat, prairie dog habitat and uh, uh, trout habitat. So as well as other native uh, uh, fish, non fisheries, non uh, sport fish species. Uh, so that, that's kind of where we're going to. And the MCDA, the idea is as you look through the MCDA, uh, hopefully your MCDA score will reduce as it reduces at higher design levels. Hopefully, then it becomes more optimal. Uh, and that's kind of how we try to get to an optimal design based on all the goals and objectives. So instead of saying, hey, we need to do the same design every single time. So we need to do a natural channel design. Uh, this is a way that we can lay out our goals and objectives and we can look at the different processes, try to assign an objective, objectives to that. And then we have some sort of qualitative assessment on each um, objective based on the alternatives. And then we can quantify those qualitative assessments. So. It, these numbers aren't near as quantified as you might think they are because they're very qualitative in how we get to the numbers, but they at least give us some frame of reference to say that this is more optimal or less optimal than another, another option. So our project is on Dry Spot Tail Creek. Dry Spot Tail Creek, the start of the project um, uh, is where it says start of the project on the screen and it's for about a half mile of stream and it is a linear ditch. This is in the panhandle of Nebraska, um, about a half hour from the Wyoming line, uh, right near Scotts Bluff, <coughs> Nebraska. And this channel was channelized years ago um, and Dry Spot Till Creek uh, is just a straight line ditch right now. And even when we surveyed it, there's so little sedimentation coming down through the system that you can still see a lot of the relics of where the anthropogenic berm was built and how much material has been thrown over the side or side cast for the anthropogenic berm. And then the amount of material that's been cut down since 1950 is very small. So there's a little bit of erosion that's occurring here, but not much. And there's not a whole lot of 
sediment coming into this site. So it's a very low sediment supply uh, system. Dry Spot Tail Creek in uh, 1950, uh, two was this 1952 aerial photography and sometime before that it was channelized. You can see it looks about as straight as the roads uh, that it crosses over upstream and this and you can see the looks of where the uh, channel had been historically. Um, it kind of goes down parallel to that um, larger river down there. The larger river is the North Platte River um, and the dry spot Trail Creek had historically flown parallel uh, to that river and now it's just um, a ditch. But that ditch happened to be pretty good for trout fishing. Uh, and just because of where it's at locally and how it's connected to North Platte River, uh, people could catch some fish in there and they could do better. Uh, it wasn't its best, but it, they could definitely catch fish. And the idea here is we were, try we're trying to come up with a solution that will create a fishery that will also look like a fishery and give people a little bit different experience. So we have a fisheries and habitat improvements for salmonid gold. So part of the fisheries goal is just make a stream that looks more like a stream, not a ditch. Um, as kids come out and get to, for somebody like Trout Unlimited, as kids get to come out and learn what trout fishing is, you know, they have a desire that kids can experience trout fishing and not look at a ditch and be like, okay, well, this is kind of what it's supposed to look like. So it kind of changes how we look at it. So part of it's aesthetic um, and cultural, and then other parts of it is just getting access for fishermen so the banks aren't so high, so there's not hazards. Um, and then there's also some drainage and irrigation issues with water rights. There's uh, project risk goals. We don't want to flood out the upstream road. We want this to be a good demonstration project that people can be involved with. We wanted there to be funded opportunities because this project was not funded when we started with them. And we wanted uh, land management and conservation goals as well as a stable stream. A lot of times the stream morphology uh, of our projects trump everything else because they're so unstable. This was not the case here. Uh, the, um, the stream was in a quasi equilibrium state. Uh, and it was fairly stable. It's just, it wasn't kind of the riffle pool sequence. It wasn't well connected to its floodplain. It didn't have good floodplain connectivity. It didn't have great habitat. Uh, and it didn't produce a stream that was what Nebraska Game and Parks and Trout Unlimited really wanted to encourage people that could be a potential uh, trout fishery in this region. So this project, we had uh, uh, 52 objectives in it. Uh, we had uh, 18 different stakeholders and we had nine alternatives that we went over. Um, we used the MCDA to come up with this. Uh, I kind of limited the MCDA to just one goal at the time. So the one goal was improved fisheries and habitat for salmonids. So inside of that, we had uh, groundwater influence, cold water fishery. So we wanted to make sure that we stayed on something that would have uh, influence of cold water fishery from the groundwater. We didn't want to purge a stream. Uh, Reestablish repairing wetlands through the system. Establish repairing vegetation, deep sustainable pools, overhead and bank cover. Uh, sustainable spawning gravels in the riffles, connectivity to the North Platte. Uh, potential barrier to the North Platte. So we wanted the idea of being able to make a barrier if we wanted to, although we wanted to be able to have connectivity um, as well. So it wasn't kind of discontinuous. And then we wanted a uh, cold water fishery and then no additional heating through inline poles and increased fisheries length. So part of this was just, we want more fish in length. So it was a straight line ditch. And can we make a stream that's a half mile long opposed to a thousand feet in, in a section or can we make a stream that's a mile long instead of a half mile long. So the first option we looked at was just a fencing. We had a do nothing option which was option A and then option B was just fencing and pathway enhancement. So this is making some pathways so people can get down to the uh, dry spot tail creek, uh, making a uh, access points and then just fencing cattle out. Cattle out and uh, um, and that, that was our first alternative. Um, and with that, it didn't produce 
a lot of improvement in our fisheries habitat. On an MCDA, one is your best score, five is your, is your worst score, so it's kind of a golf score. You can see here that that was definitely not uh, a very well received option. We have a lot of fives and fours in here. Um, it still had connectivity to North Platte, so that wasn't bad, but we ended up looking at alternatives uh, and through our other eight alternatives, we found ones that were more optimal for these goals and objectives. But originally the client put together a design with Ducks Unlimited and they basically kept the straight line ditch where it was and then they wanted to create an additional mile of stream that connected to the North Platte River. Uh, so we had looked at that and initially when I looked at it, I said, well, there's no way that's going to work. The whole channel is going to fill in with sediment and it's going to fail. Well, we started looking at it and realized that there's such a low sediment supply that you might have been able to make uh, the sediment transport work through there just because you had very little sediment transport, but um, you may have more maintenance issues that came up uh, and it may have been harder to kind of keep vegetation from growing up in the channel and then it would be more of a swamp than it would be a flow and water feature. Uh, and then with the overflow, if we wanted to raise up the channel a whole lot, reconnect, we'd be doing a lot of fill and topography issues. So that was our original design. As we looked at that, there were definitely some improvements that we looked at, um, but the sustainable spawning gravels for the riffles was not gonna be sustainable because uh, at that point, you're not, you're just going to embed all the 40 to 70 millimeter particles because the uh, slope was so flat. You're not going to even get enough uh, scour to scour off the sands. So it's just going to fill in. Um, so that was one of the things that was very negative about that design. And we started looking at some of the other alternatives and we came up with this uh, cartoon of taking the point where we come off of the old ditch and moving it upstream and we had some prairie dogs that we were concerned about in this location uh, so we didn't want to get into a prairie dog um, uh, colony or town uh, so we were trying to work around that and then we still wanted to connect about the same location so this allowed us to have more slope which means we could we felt like we could keep spawning gravels down that could scour away the fine materials and not become as embedded as quickly and with that, we had better connection to the floodplain because we were able to reconnect to land surface because we were higher away from uh, the North Platte River on, an, on a former uh, floodplain or a terrace of the North Platte River that we could work our way down and we could create a barrier. So with this, we were able to lay out these alternatives. And with these alternatives, we were able to go through, like I said, nine, nine different alternatives with uh, 52 objectives uh, or criteria with 18 stakeholders and we were able to use this MCDA and one day we went into a hotel room, went through all the criteria, worked back and forth on weighting factors and we came up with our optimal design and we had all the people give input and kind of went around the table and it was a fairly boring day. It was nice to hear people's thoughts but it was, it was a pretty long day. But the good thing is at the end of the day, um, after having the 18 stakeholders involved, um, we came up with a preferred alternative and we didn't fall backwards from that. So we just be, were able to stay with that preferred alternative through the entire design. That's what we're implementing. Now, we still optimized from there and we changed the MCDA as we moved to different um, optimal designs. So uh, there's one thing about this MCDA we're showing here shows nine different concept designs, but then even within a concept design, once you say this is my preferred concept design, then you can continue to use the MCDA for the 30% design, 60% design, 100% design. So this is what the MCDA had looked like. Um, this, is a, this is a big deal. So when we're trying to communicate with a lot of um, stakeholders when we're trying to communicate with a lot of competing goals and objectives, uh, it's really important for us to be able to uh, uh, lay it out in a way that we can document what people's uh, opinions were. Even if we forget which persons that was, it's important that we 
have a documentation of something we can kind of send around to have people review and then say, okay, this is where we're at. And we may forget who said this is the most important weight and factor and raising the weight and factor or this value should be a five, but we know that it was documented um, and it's something to move forward with. So what we came up with after we looked at the entire MCDA is that our preferred alternative was creating an upstream, going farther upstream um, and working downstream with a sinuous channel that was closer to 1.8 sinuosity and doing some um, realignment for the major realignment for that reach. So the reason that I shared this today um, is just to really emphasize before we've shown an MCDA, but this one I wanted to emphasize the idea of using the alternatives, trying to tie it into different ideas for fisheries and really emphasize the idea that, um, you know, every design can use different tools. So if this design had a potential for beaver dam analogs, then it should have been one of the alternatives in the MCDA. Uh, we should have had a beaver dam analog system in there. This one did not have a great potential for that because we didn't have a whole lot of trees and, and willows source nearby. Um, and uh, what we were doing was pretty flat slope. So we didn't want, that wasn't one of our desires for this one, but it is important that, you know, we don't get stuck on saying, okay, well, every design has to fit into uh, natural channel design, uh, river restoration project, because some of our projects, we just don't really have a high sediment supply. So we have different alternatives that could be available to us that or don't have to deal with sediment the same way that a moderate to high bed load system would require us to deal with sedimentation and sediment transport. So with that said, those are, that was my presentation for today. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts that they want to add today? All right, so uh, a couple things. Next week, um, we're gonna do the same, we'll have the same time, uh, six o'clock mountain time, eight o'clock Eastern time. Um, but at, we're gonna wait until 6.30 uh, to start the technical talk. Um, and we're gonna try to, we'll have a little bit of time uh, in between uh, the, inspiration talk and the technical talk. Uh, that way we can make sure that we're definitely done with the inspiration talk by 6.30. If people want to get on 6.30, it's just an easier time for people to kind of remember than uh, six o'clock, than 6.20. Uh, so we're going to try to do that next week. Uh, next week, our technical talk will be on J-hooks. Um, and so that's what we'll be talking about next week for uh, J-hook structure design. As I discussed before, the second week of every month, we're gonna talk about uh, kind of detailed failure mechanisms and how to design and the history of different structures and kind of where we're at. So next week, we'll talk about J-hooks. Um, and then uh, uh, from uh, there, if anybody on the line wants to lead the discussion on J-hooks next week, uh, I'd be more than happy to let you. If not, I'll put together something on J-hooks. Um, and then if anybody else technically wants to lead a talk on something technical, uh, let me know and then we'll work you into schedule. Um, there's going to, the week after next will be a demonstration project week. So somebody can just talk about their project. You don't have to really bring a whole lot out of the project. Uh, you can just say, hey, this is a project we worked on. This is kind of why we worked on it. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that there's an earth shattering a change in somebody's opinion or anything like that. So it's really just sharing a project. So if somebody has a project they want to share for the third week of October, uh, let me know and we'll let you kind of present to the group. Related to the uh, uh, inspirational talks, uh, if there's anybody online that wants to give an inspirational talk, uh, we'll, we'd be more than happy to hear it from anybody on there. I do not want, um, most of my inspiration does come from my relationship with Christ. And that's the big, that's the big part of inspiration in my life. So when I hear, when I give a talk, 
it's hard for me to separate my inspiration from where it comes from. Um, but we are also open to people that have inspiration that comes from other aspects of life to share their inspiration also. Uh, so I am definitely looking for other people to share inspiration, whether you come from a, a Hindu uh, tradition, whether you come from a, a Buddhist faith, whether you come from a Jewish tradition, whether you come from a, you know another idea or if you come from an agnostic, but you find hope and inspiration in some aspect, uh, we want to listen. We want to be able to hear that. We want we we appreciate it. We if there's something that you get inspiration from that you think you can share with others and they can get inspiration from, I think that's really important. Uh, it's something we're missing today. Um, that uh, as Josh said, inspiration inspires inspiration. Uh, I like that, Josh. Uh, so I think we miss sometimes when we have varying opinions. Uh, sometimes we don't listen enough to be inspired by things that we're not used to. Uh, so anyways, with that, any thoughts or questions today? Hey, it's Jonathan. Um, I, I hope and pray for you and your family on your house uh, and, and that situation. I do have a, a question. I've, I've logged in and I've, well, I've tried to pull up the rivershared.org uh, website a couple of times uh, and it's being blocked by the site owner. Um, it's not uh, my company's typical uh, block or, or bad website or anything like that. Uh, it says I don't have uh, access or it's been limited by the site owner. I can get in on my phone, but for some reason it's... Uh, um, it's blocking me and it's it's not our typical company's uh, firewall so I don't know if that's something we can check into or, or what yeah yeah send us a screen capture of that and copy send it to Brad Fairley and myself and if you Brad Fairley's emails on the thing but if you don't if you don't uh, I got find it, I'll forward it on to him and then we'll we'll try to find out All what's right. going on. thank you yeah thank you thank you for letting us know I appreciate it uh, we do have, um, we have separated all the talks, both technically and uh, inspirationally, uh, and they're all available and they will be going on the website soon. Uh, but we, we are working through kind of um, transition of the website and stuff too. So Brad, do you have any more thoughts or comments on where that's going or are you aware of anything there? Well, I, I had a conversation on Friday night with Truman, so we're, we're um, <clears throat> trying to get the organization of it set up, and we're in busy gathering material to populate it. So um, it's not going to be rolled out for at least a month, maybe a month and a half, um, but we're, it's going to take us a while to get everything populated, but we are going to transition over to the new one fairly shortly. So uh, the existing one's pretty limited. Uh, the new one will be much improved and will be based on a structure that the uh, the executive came up with, which we think will facilitate use and interaction with uh, membership and others. So stay tuned. Hey Dave, this is Dave Huntress. Do you have a few minutes to talk about a project after this call? Sure, I'll just, you can stay on, I can stay on the line if that's okay with you. Hey Dave, right. you have to wait till I'm done, then you can have them. That's perfect, Brad. Actually, you might want to stick around for this too. Okay, thanks. Brad, Dave, I just sent y'all that screenshot. If y'all don't get it, uh, just give me a holler. Thanks, Jonathan. No problem. Thank y'all. All right. Well, th thank you very much, guys. Have a great day. Have a good week. And uh, like I said, if anybody has something they want to share for inspiration, please let me know if anybody has something you want to share technically. Uh, let me know as well. Uh, the more people we can get involved in sharing, the better it's going to be for the group. See you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Ian, week. Dave. Appreciate it. Hey, you bet. See ya. Hey, Dave, it's Brad. Did you get my email about the cost estimate for the brief? Cost estimate for the breach. Um, uh, it was an email I sent last week, and basically Elmore wants a cost estimate for basically because they're they don't think they want to put the uh, 
the design in with the spillway for the north breach, they want to actually seal it off permanently. Oh, okay, I got you. I got you. So Are you with me? Yep, I, I, I am, yeah. So if you could just pull together a rough cost estimate for design and construction and give me some idea about whether, you know, the guys there can do some of it themselves, probably with supervision they could, but without supervision, maybe not. So if you just... That's, that's, for, that's for the upstream breach, right? Yeah, and the so, piece that, in the piece where we were going to abandon it, but they think they want to try and leave it live, so they want to they want they want to move from a temporary fix to a potentially a permanent fix. They they don't want to do realignment, or do they want to do realignment, or they just want to stabilize it and be permanent on um, realignment? You mean move it, the whole channel over to the new area? Yeah. No, they they're they're one they're considering not moving it at all now. Okay. 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 So, so uh, it would be a, a permanent fix of the breach where it is. Okay. So the idea is they would just uh, fix the breach exactly where it's at and design in a way that uh, it's not going to. Sorry, you're, you're breaking up, Dave. I can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I got you now. So basically they want a permanent fix where it is right now. Okay, sounds good. So if you could get me that by, uh, by close of business today, that'd be great. Again, it can be a back of the envelope, Dave. You do that. Thank you so much. That was it, Deb. I had a couple other questions, Dave Huntress, but they're not important. So if you want to yeah, go. Yeah, I can do that. You bet. Sure, I'm just starting up my video here. Um, so I have, uh, well, my father-in-law is, is a member of a salmon camp up on the Miramichi um, up in Canada, and they are having an issue um, with the pool in front of their camp. They, they did some uh, work on the, the main river a number of years ago before I met them, and they might have built a bank up a little bit too proud, um, and it's causing a bit of a lag deposit on the downstream side happens to be uh, right where their cold water brook dumps in and the, the salmon hold right below that. And they're getting very nervous. The sediment supply from the brook is not being mobilized from in front of the brook right now. Um, and what it's doing is over time is that uh, bar builds out of the mouth of the brook. It's pushing the holding water for the salmon further and for, further towards the far shore. Um, which puts those fish within casting range of the public water on the far shore. Um, there's a 66 foot uh, government holding over there that the public is allowed to fish from, um, which puts those fish at risk for, for angling mortality and stuff. So they'd like to keep those fish closer to the mouth of that brook and are looking for some ideas on um, what they should do with this aggradation of material. At the moment, they're simply thinking about digging the material out, uh, which I don't think is going to solve their problem. I think it's going to be an ongoing thing. Um, and so I, I wanted to run some ideas past you, Dave and Brad, since this project is in Canada and I'm not licensed in Canada, uh, it would involve probably pulling somebody like yourself in at some point to work through those issues. Yeah, just, just to give you a heads up, the first thing that hit me out of that, aside from the technical issues, is you're going to need a, a fairly difficult permit to do this, you know. You can't go digging in rivers yeah, without, yep. without the federal government being pretty uh, pretty anal about it. So uh, just, just a heads up. Yeah, and they've been through that before. Um, okay. They they understand that side of okay. things. Again, just they're wanted just to make sure that very... they were aware that, you know, DFO will be all over them before they agree to it, so... Yeah, so I'm just trying to um, steer them in the right direction for what their possibilities are with the realization that there is going to be permitting issues. And since this is a cold water holding pool, um, but the folks here are heavily involved with the Miramichi Salmon Association that does quite a bit of in-river work yeah. up there. So they're used to um, these sort of projects and whatnot. So I'm They've less concerned rep. about that at the moment. Yeah. They got a good reputation, so it's probably a technical issue. So Dave, if you can, it's probably between Dave and Dave to figure out what to do, and I can give you some advice on permitting if need be. Okay. Uh, how do I share my screen on this thing? 
Just press the big uh, green so button here. at the bottom. Share Perfect. screen. Can you see that? You got to, yeah. Yeah, we got it now. All right. So here's the, uh, basically the, the site is right here. The salmon camp's here. They own, oh, on this side, about 300 feet down uh, up to about here. This side they own somewhere down here, up and around about two miles of water on the Canes River. This is the uh, main southwest Miramichi. This is Black Brook coming in right here. Um, and they, a number of years ago, did a habitat improvement project here in conjunction with the MSA. Uh, this was a fairly low spot. Um, Bankful is this kind of green area along here. Um, but there was a low area where Blackbrook dumped in and they, they built this area up, um, made the bank a little bit steeper of a, an angle here going down to the water um, so that they could ford across. They put a bridge in is to cross it at higher flows um, to be able to get up to their angling area on the side. They fish both from this side and this side. Um, the cold water holding pool, there, there's two pockets the fish hold in right here. Obviously, this bar is pushing that cold water further out into the middle of the river. Um, and away from the camp and closer to this area. So they did a um, like a rock vein step pool drop structure uh, in this reach right here, stabilized basically from the bridge down to about here. Um, there's probably five or six feet of elevation drop over that distance. Uh, but then right at the mouth, um, they had a big storm about five or six years ago that, that moved a lot of uh, gravel and cobble sized material uh, dropped out of suspension in the, the river right here and hasn't moved since uh, and has annually been building out in this area. There's a bit of a point bar as you can see here. Ideally trying to mobilize this material from right here and get it to drop out a little bit further down the shore I think is what they would be hoping for. Um, trying to keep those fish kind of right in this pocket right here. Um, so I'm, I'm looking for uh, ideas on that. One thought I had would be for them to put a rock vein in um, to create some scour uh, in this area to mobilize that material just a little bit further down, down river. Yeah, I, I think uh, that would be kind of the first way that I would go to think about as well, uh, or maybe even you know, the other option would be maybe a small wing deflector. Um, but uh, I think I'd probably try to start with kind of like those mini veins that we did out in Yampa years ago. Um, yep. I think something might, might work out pretty well to kind of clear out that area. Okay. okay. They, have, they have any profile at all on it or... I don't, I don't have any technical information. They're just kind of looking at concept information. I've looked at this. I've been up there fishing a few times over the last few years, and this has been an ongoing discussion. It comes up periodically, and then it goes away. This year, with it being such a drought, um, there have been some photos that came back down from the camp manager um, trying to get people to think about it if they want to do something a little bit more aggressively. At least they realize at the moment that they're not going to get in the water and do this this year, um, given the permitting timelines and, and all. So um, looking ahead to next year, I'm just trying to get in front of this now. Obviously, the border is closed, so I can't go over and put eyes on it right now. Um, but I, I sort of know, you know, what's going on. There's a lot of sand buildup in this area just down from here. Again, I think that's a lag deposit from the way they built out the bank. Um, on the upstream side of the brook and the main river is losing a bunch of sand in this area now, which really concerns them. They were wanting to go out there and vacuum that out a year or two ago. I talked them out of that um, and said, wait and see what the river does with another spring freshet and uh, ice flows and whatnot. But this gravel bar doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And so they're, they're getting more serious about wanting to do something here. And, uh, protecting and enhancing the cold water pools is kind of a big deal on the Miramichi these days. So, so when they built that berm, uh, where did they build it to? How much is it? Is this exactly kind of the length that they built it to or has it grown? Yeah, up? so they didn't build this. This was the brook itself just degrading material out into the river. Okay. They built up this area here. 
Um, right. This area was really low. Basically, the brook came down, and this was an alluvial fan yeah. that used to dissipate material out. And somebody talked them into building this up so that they could walk across on nice high ground. Um, and they built a nice defined stream channel. And they did nice work with all of that, but they didn't take into account the material that comes down this brook naturally and where that material would go, um, what effect that might have on their, their cold water holding pool. And because this bank is, um, you know, it's not as flat as what this right here may, may seem. It's, it's fairly steep and then it flattens out down here. Um, so again, fairly steep, maybe a one on 10, maybe a little bit steeper than that, even coming up this bank up to a plateau at the bank full level here um end result is you know the way things angle out here is they get some sand depositing in the pool down here and then this gravel material there's the river just doesn't seem to have the power to move that through right now what's the um right where you have your red line drawn what is yep. that uh what's that light color it's in, in the middle of the channel that's their rock drop structure that's the tail end of it it, it starts there, there's actually rock from above the bridge down to that point, but that's the steeper spot. They come through kind of flat, and then they drop down to the um, closer to the river with some boulder, uh, boulder constructed riffle is what I would call it. And then is that drop structure? Is it uh, from the content from the confined area with the roadway all the way down to the channel at about ten to one at a ten percent slope? Or uh, yeah, it it pretty much. Um, I think it's a pretty consistent slope, maybe maybe 5% to here, and then there's a couple of bigger steps here because the natural bank dropped off a little bit steeper in that area. Um, it does not, as far as I know, go all the way out to the river. Um, I've got a question, Dave, if I might. Um, yep. Dave, have you checked the flows? That, I mean, when did they do this work where they, they increased this embankment on just south of where you're uh, um, well, so here it is in 2013 to give you an idea. Okay. Um, the brook used to be through over here. You can see there's this kind of valley section yeah. um, that hadn't been built up. And whenever there was water in the river, like this is a fairly high flow. Uh, this is yeah. probably equivalent to Bankful right here. Um, they had trouble getting across without, you know, obviously they're wearing waders and whatnot, but um, this this area could be inundated. And so they came in and Oh, that one's clouded out. I, I think they did this in like 2010, 20, or 2014, 2015. This gives you a little different perspective. They really um, changed just the after angle of the creek. That. They really changed they did. the angle They realigned the it. They brought it yep. in at a hard right angle. Correct. Why did they do that? I don't it's know. Shorter. I forget who it was. They thought they had a top of the line person doing geomorphic work. Mm. I looked I just, at it and said, boy, anyway, I, don't, the, I don't know that. The, the only thing I was wondering about was basically, I was wondering, I mean, if, if we've had sort of low flow years since the work, yeah, see how much they've changed the angle? Boy. Yeah. No, I'm they definitely have had some. Any, any chance whether a, a decent natural flow might push this sand gravel bar out of the way? I mean, have we had relatively, relatively low flows or have we had, what have we had? Well, it's been seven or eight years. We have had a couple of low water seasons or this year was a drought probably the drought of record. Um, 2015 was a drought, uh, but there's been some sp spring flows in there and I would expect okay. ice breakup on the Miramichi. Again, okay. this, this is the bank full line here. I would expect yeah. that to um, move those, but I think unfortunately when the flow gets that high, uh, uh, this area is somewhat sheltered. There's you know things yeah. going on in the river up here that slow the current down in that particular area. Yeah, just wondering anyway, it was just a shot in the dark. So that's that's my limited ability to add value to this discussion. Yeah, no, I I, I agree with you that I, I don't know that I would have realigned it the way they realigned this um this channel on honestly. I mean the other the other what about the bizarre idea? What what about going out behind the where the where the gravel is? What do you mean? Cut right through right where your hand is, right there. Right here? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, is that going to solve the issue, though, of, of needing to mobilize some gravel and, and not have it, like, they want to maintain a holding pool on 
the right side of the river as opposed to it building this way. Yeah. Where's, Dave, where's the uh, upstream? It doesn't look like you have a huge discoloration in the aerial photography. Uh, where's the sediment coming from? Uh, on this channel? Yeah. I honestly, um, I think a lot of that sediment came from one big torrent that they had after construction. You can see some beaver dams here though. And that historically there was a beaver pond here. There's a lot of dead trees out there that show evidence sometime in the last 20 years or so that there was a beaver dam somewhere in here. Um, with that, that's natural uh, perturbations, you know, in these systems up here that you end up getting a slug of sediment when a beaver dam blows out uh, that'll move down through a system. Otherwise, um, I'm not sure if there's some bank erosion going on somewhere here. I have not walked this, this brook very far up. Um, it's very stable down here. It has nice um, width to depth ratio. It's a nice, uh, really ideal spawning and rearing habitat for Atlantic salmon and brook trout. How come? Um, so it, it has the ability to move material through it. How come are you, Dave, that the material that's being generated is uh, coming from the brook opposed to coming from the river? Yeah, it's definitely coming down the brook. The, the, this bar right here at the mouth of the brook is, is definitely material that's an alluvial fan right at the mouth of the brook, right below that change in pitch. Um, the sand that's further out in the pool is associated with the larger watershed as opposed to the brook. But There's a bank um, right up here, half a mile upstream that's uh, eroding, big sandy bank. Um, and so you're, we're getting some lag deposit coming off down here below these points, point bars. And these two rivers quite often are out of sync in terms of their flows. Yeah. So the, um, right now the bar that's formed down there of the brook, downstream of the brook, that's a coarser sediment than what the, chan than what the river channel is, right? Correct. Yeah, the river channel itself is fairly stable. Um, it's mostly a, a sand bed with a small gravel fraction to it. Um, there is a bit of a, a bar up here that's got some coarser material to it, but most of what you, of what you see moving through here is, is sand, which I would expect on a big river like this of this size, fairly low in the watershed. Um, the brook though is, is definitely, you know, gravel cobble material coming down it. I was going to say, I, you know, the things I look at is you're, you're, going to have, you're going to have some transition down valley, of course, uh, but right now you're not coming in a deep part of the pool uh, just because you're coming in over the, over the point bar side of it uh, and you're not longitudinally in the place where you're going to be in the deepest part of the pool. So there's, there's part of me that would say... Um, where it's located at, there's going to have to be the expectation of maintenance in the future. Uh, so I would be a little surprised with saying, okay, we can give an, an option that doesn't require maintenance. I'm, I'm sorry, Dave. Can you speak up just a little bit? I'm turning up my audio, but uh, oh, you, you yeah. faded out on me there. Can you hear me better now? I can. Okay. Um, because of the location longitudinally in the profile, you're not really down in the max point of the pool or the max scour. Um, and then when in, and then you're also coming in from the, the bank where you have a um, bar located at. So you have two things going against you that makes me kind of wonder um, if a sustainable option for this confluence uh, that, keep, that flows into a deeper pool is really possible or if you have to kind of kind of say hey we're going to have something that's going to require a little bit less maintenance but it's still going to require maintenance and that's that's the first thing that jumps out at me so yeah no i i agree with that i was just trying to think about a way to mitigate to keep material maybe moving knowing material is going to continue coming at them um, but maybe just to keep it moving just a little bit further down uh, hopefully, uh, you know, to this area here, uh, which is pretty shallow and they don't mind if, if material grades up in that area, but 
to keep it moving, you know, in this pocket. They're looking for a, a hole there that might be 20 feet wide and, and 50 feet long. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, I think something like a minivan would probably do fine. Probably make it steep uh, to throw in there. The other idea is, you know, something like Brad had said with realigning it a little bit might be helpful or trying to redo something in the river might be helpful, but then you're talking really expensive and very time consuming. So my thought is probably an alternative of just putting it in a mini vein would be good. The issue that I see though is that uh, you're going to have to uh, tie it in um, to the bank full stage there. Uh, so your scour pool, you know, you may have a little bit of a hole, but then that deposition may go just right downstream because of how narrow the river is there and the, con the contraction in the bank full stage. Yeah. I, I should back up and tell you there's a run, you know, the, the coming out of this riffle before you really get into the pool down here. There's probably eight or nine feet of water out here in this darker uh, segment of water versus three to five feet in this area here. This is a deeper channel on the far shore over here. Um, what I'm not sure about, tying a vein um, into the bankful. Bankful is going to be back up here. Yeah. You know, so um, thinking about that, you know, that would involve bringing a vein all the way up here somewhere. Um, they still need fish passage coming up into this brook. How would you do that with a vein arm and having to do a, a slope here and tying into bankful? Yeah, and that's actually kind of what my, that's kind of what I was trying to get at with that too. So I'm, I, um, you'd almost have to have it drop over the vein arm uh, and then work that vein arm into a uh, step pool in the brook, which you could do. It's just going to be a little bit more difficult to design. Can you send me a, a pinpoint of this and can we, can, I'll look at it a little bit today um, and then just give me where they want to have the pool at. I'm assuming it's really close to there, but just give me that. And then yeah, I mean, they're, they're just looking to have the, the pool basically in this area. Right now, the, the fish are holding here and they're holding back here and they have a nice little deck built out here where you can go and sit with a cigar and a cocktail, um, you know, during the middle of the day when the fishing's not good and admire the fish out in front of the camp and they want to maintain the ability to do that. This pool is probably one of the two premier Atlantic salmon pools in the Miramichi system, if not all of Eastern Canada. So the membership is, um, they want to protect it. What I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll send you this pin. I'll also send you where I was thinking the vein arm and basically where the holding water is right now, um, where they'd like it to be. How's that? That sounds good. That sounds good. Yeah. I, th I think you're probably on the right track with kind of doing a mini vein. It's just how you tie it because generally we tie in horizontally the bank full, I mean, sorry, we tie in uh, horizontally the bank full and vertically the inner berm. Uh, so that would be kind of the question if that's even feasible here. Yeah, so that was actually one of the questions I had in terms of do we ever put veins in and not tie them in to bank full elevation wise, but more uh, something below bank full? And that's not something, a question I've, I've heard articulated by anybody before. So we actually, we always tie veins into, I try to tie them into horizontally bankful, but they get tied in on an elevation standpoint closer to the inner berm stage. Uh, okay. So but you don't, even though it's the, the tie-in where it changes from being an angle to the sill, that's at bankful horizontally on plan form. It's usually that point is down uh, just above the inner berm stage, but below the bankful stage. So that's pretty okay. common. Okay. Um, well, let me, uh, I appreciate your time. Uh, I'll send you a couple of things here. Again, I'm just kind of spitballing with, uh, with folks on my end. Um, I don't know that it'll materialize into a project, but these folks have the resources to make this happen um, if they want. So um, I suspect they're going to do something and this is gonna stir up a conversation over the course of the winter that hopefully by spring, they have made a decision on whether or not they wanna move forward with a project. and. Hopefully by that point, the border is reopened because right now none of the membership of this camp can go up there, so. Oh, wow, that's interesting.
<laughs> yeah, well, the border being closed screwed up a lot of fishermen's plans this year. I imagine. So, uh, hey, how's, how's things going for you? Are you finding work or? Um, you know, things are going slow, uh, as I expected them, frankly, to be. Um, I've got, you know, a few leads. I, I came in, the, the, the bid that I told you I was chasing before, I, I ended up being the number three bid. They issued contracts to the first two uh, low bidders. Unfortunately, the, um, the low bidder really underbid the project, left about $70,000 on the table. Um, and they discounted bids that were more than 130% of the low bid. Oh, wow. As opposed to looking at it from the standpoint of what are the spread on bids if you have multiple bids that are really close together, um, dropping the low bid if it's an outlier is usually the way state contracts go and they didn't do that with this one. So um, unfortunately I missed out on uh, what would have been a fairly sizable chunk of work over the next year. Got a few other small things, but I mean, that's the nature of the market up here is it's feast or famine and uh, trying to get in on a project to get things rolling, you know, and I, right now I've got nothing going on. So that's really what it comes down to. I've been remodeling my house and uh, chasing projects where I, when they come up, so. Okay. Do you, yeah, do you have any uh, availability to kind of travel for anything yet or not yet or? Possibly. Um, so my uncle has been trying to hire me to help out uh, this fall with his well drilling business. He unfortunately thought he was having a heart attack on Thursday, ended up going into the hospital, had fluid on the lungs, and uh, they're changing up some meds and whatnot. He didn't have a heart attack, but he's in the hospital until Wednesday. But I told him I would be available to help him out uh, keeping his business running. He's got seven or eight guys that work for him. So um I'm waiting to hear back from him on whether or not he definitely needs help. I think he does. So, but potentially, um, depending on, you know, where, when, that sort of stuff. Got a lot yeah, of so other stuff going on too right now. I had a couple things come up last week that I thought of you for. Um, basically, I was out with Brent and Bob again. Uh, Brent. Oh, Bob, really? He was mentioned about Dave. He always, uh, he always goes, hey, how's little Dave doing? Which I never called you little Dave, but he did, I guess. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, but uh, well, I am shorter than you. <laughs> that's right. uh, so, anyways, um, I talked to him a bit, and we're doing some things with him trying to create a mitigation bank. Uh, Nate Ober is now working for Land and Water Solutions, and he's trying to create a mitigation bank on Wolf Mountain Ranch. Uh, so, uh, uh, that was what I was thinking about you with, and my thought was, well, if you have time, maybe I'll see if you can get out here uh, in the next couple, in the next month or so. So, yeah, no, I can probably help out. Uh, how's that area of the world doing? Um, you still uh, traveling around, not being able to go home? Yeah, yeah, we are, but uh, that area is not burning. Uh, but uh, at our house, there's burns and stuff going on, so. Uh, I'm going to try to look into a little bit, see what, see what I want to do with it. I'll get back to you, let you know, and uh, see if we can work you into something. So, Okay. Sounds good. Well, hey, Dave, I appreciate your time on this, and um, I'll send you a couple of things, and if you could look at it and just kind of get back to me, I just I want to be, um, you know, forward with the, the membership and get back to them on what I see as their uh, – potential and obviously they're going to have to pull big permits and get bigger people involved for that so all right we'll talk to you later all right thanks dave bye